Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sébastien Combefis, who is a lecturer at ECAM, ECAM Brussels Engineering School. He will talk on the subject, the only way to create the skills of the future is to disrupt the education of today. Mr. Combefis. Hello, everyone. So uh, thank you for the introduction. So just a little bit uh, about me first. So as it was said, I am uh, teaching in a higher education institution for uh, future computer science engineers. That's my, my main job, I would say. And then uh, besides that, I'm also involved in one nonprofit organization that tries to uh, teach computer science concepts to pupils from primary and secondary uh, education to uh, make them more aware of the digital um, skills. And the uh, last point, um, I'm also working as the head of advisory board of a private company whose goal is to create IT challenges that will connect together students uh, IT professionals, this is companies, and academic world. And in this company, what we are doing is we create IT challenges. So the questions are created by academic people and by people uh, from the industry. And we are proposing the challenges to the students that will participate to the challenge, and then will come uh, to the headquarters of the company and meet the people who are working there, the um, human resource people, etc., just to make them aware and to create the link uh, the important link, academy, industry, uh, student. So, that was a little, little bit about me. Then uh, I will move to, to the topic of this keynote, which is creating the skills of the future. How to do this? Maybe by disrupting the education system. So first, let me just uh, illustrate you what I will talk about with a, a simple story. Let's imagine, uh, imagination is one very important skill for the future. Let's imagine that we have a classroom here, that I am the, the teacher of the, the classroom, primary or secondary classroom. So, I am the teacher of the room and I have some students there. I arrive in my class and I start my class. Okay, hello everyone, I'm a, your new geography uh, teacher. And today we will, uh, Brian, please, please, Brian, keep calm, uh, the lesson started. Thank you, Brian. So I'm your new geography teacher. And today we will talk about uh, our country, uh, United um, Arab Emirates, UAE. And Brian, please, your phone, put it in your bag. No phone in my classroom. Thank you, Brian. So um, UAE, a big country. You know, the, the capital is uh, Abu Dhabi, the largest city is Dubai, and you have about um, 9 million inhabitants in um, this country, etc., etc., etc. Then, some days later, okay, it's again the geography course, the teacher uh, is arriving in the room, and just to check, to evaluate, to measure if the pupils learned something, from the previous course, he's asking to the class, okay, I will ask you some questions. And of course, since the teacher is a little bit angry against Brian, he will ask Brian some questions. So Brian, please, do you remember what I told you last time? Can you tell me what's the number of inhabitants of um, UAE? So now I am Brian. Um, yes, teacher. Um, wait, 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 teacher. Mm. UAE, UAE, UAE is exactly 9,599,353 inhabitants as of the 2018 estimates, teacher. It's something that we can observe today in classrooms and it's a big contrast. The contrast between education, 1.0. You have a teacher in front of a classroom, 25, 30 pupils. It's the same anywhere in the world, in the general global standard education system. 
But the real world is a education, uh, industry 4.0 world with the new technologies, robots, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and a lot of things like that. And so there is a gap there. The pupils are living in today's world, 4.0. Education teachers are still in the 1.0 world. So there is one first observation that we can do. The second observation that we can do is this digital disruption. And you heard about it previous days. Today, you have this digital gap. The teachers do not understand new technologies. Pupils, students are living with this technology, are born with this. You heard yesterday about this uh, generation, generation Y, uh, generation Z. And we also have today the next generation, people who are born uh, starting 2010, which is the alpha generation. So if we want to invent the education of the future, we have to understand how these pupils are working, are thinking. We cannot change them. So we have to adapt to them. So this digital gap is the first important thing to, to observe. And the second one is this extended consciousness. Today, everything is not anymore just in the brain. You have access to a lot of information through smartphone, through internet, through the cloud. And so why do we still teach to uh, pupils what's the number of inhabitants of a country in a geography course? We don't have to teach that to them. We don't want them to remember this. They can have access to the information uh, elsewhere. What we have to teach them is how to access this information, how to check if it's uh, precise information. We have to teach them why it's important to know the number of inhabitants of a country, if it is, of course. So that's the skills we have to teach them. We do not need any more to um, teach them some facts. They have access to this in what we call this extended uh, consciousness. So that's two observations, important observation. Uh, the education 1.0 that should uh, change and this digital world that is here. We cannot change it. We don't have, I think, to change it, but we have to adapt to it as uh, educators. So, the future, future skills. We don't know what will be the future. Of course, the future will be completely uncertain. What I can say here, I just take a quote from uh, Malcolm X, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare it for today. So it means that when we educate our pupils, what we have to do, the skills that we have to give to them, are exactly the skills that will help them to create this future. That's what we have to do. That's what we have to identify. Of course, it's not an easy question. I don't have an answer to this, but we already heard a lot of, um, of skills during this conference, creativity, imagination, uh, leader leadership skills, communication skills. These are the interesting, the important skills. For the rest, they have access to the extended consciousness. They don't need to learn all these. Do you still need to know how to do multiplication table? in primary school? No, you have online tools that will do it for you. You just have to understand what are multiplication? What are they used for? If you take a recipe to make 10 pancakes and you have uh, 20 people at home, you have to be able to find the right tool to do the multiplication. You have to be able to know that it is the multiplication tool that you need. That's what we have to teach pupils. So the future, we don't know. What's our role as educators? Our role is to create this future with the pupils, with the students, to co-create it, as it was said by uh, Veronica um, on the first day. And that's the role that we have, uh, I think, uh, in education. So disrupting education, what can we do? Again, I don't have one unique answer uh, to this question. I have some personal experiment I will explain you. 
For example, here I just found a, a report by OC, um, OECD where they just briefly explain the issue that we need to uh, rethink education, to, to disrupt it. And two important questions uh, are raised in this report. First is the what question. So what, what knowledge, what skills, what attitudes, what values we have to teach uh, pupils, students in school. So it's the first important question. And the second one is, of course, how? How can we change? How can we adapt? How can we think about new institutional systems, instructors, instructional systems that will make us um, equipped with a tool that will be um, efficient to teach the future um, inhabitants of the planet the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes and the values that we have uh, identified. So, there are a lot of reports like that. Uh, I invite you, of course, to, to read them. And then I will explain a little bit about one personal experiment that um, I, uh, I'm currently working on um, in my uh, university. So first, if we think about disruption in the education system, we could think about MOOCs. It was, in my opinion, the, the last, I would say, the last uh, education disruption technique. Uh, these massive open online courses. What's interesting about these MOOCs is first the massive aspect. So you are trying with this course to reach more people than with a traditional course in one school. The second important aspect uh, about MOOCs is that you have this kind of course on demand. You want to learn about something, okay, just try to find a good MOOC uh, for you. So the student will just be interested in what they want and they will try the resource and then they will follow the course and then they will learn uh, new things. So MOOCs were arrived thanks to technology, of course, internet, uh, videos, uh, online quiz, online assessment, online grading tools. That's nice. You see that the teacher uh, position change a little bit from the teacher at university just teaching a class and then going back to his stuff to a little bit more of a coach, a mentor that will animate the community, the online community, that will um, provide exercises, that will do some videos with the students. So this active role is very interesting and the learner also become active because it's the learner that is choosing the pace at which he will follow the course. It's not just, uh, I have two hours a week of a course. Oh God, it's at 8 a.m. in the morning. It's Monday morning. I won't go. I prefer to work at night. Okay, with the MOOC, you just work at night. So that's, for me, the more recent um, disruption. It's not enough. So we have to do other things. Let me just explain you what I am trying to do um, in my school. So, Technology is just a tool that's important to remember in terms of getting the kids working together, working together, motivating them, the teacher is most important. So the teacher won't disappear. Schools, in the sense of a place where you can learn and where you can be accompanied, uh, teach, coached, will stay. But maybe it will change its form. Maybe we won't have one teacher in face of 25 or 30 students in a classroom. Maybe. So it's the future. It's our role to think about it. So what I did um, in my school is to think about this uh, learning model that I found uh, quite interesting, where you have four stages. So you start at the beginning by remembering that each learner in the world has uh, his, her own traits, characteristics, way to think, way to learn. So we have, as educational uh, people, to adapt to each learner. That's the first important point. Second level, it's what we actually do in schools. We are teaching some skills, some abilities. We are giving some knowledge to the learners. That's the first point. We have to start with this. But with the new movement, the extended consciousness, everyone has a phone, everyone has access to the internet. So you don't need any more some kind of elements from that level, in my opinion. For example, the knowledge, 
you can access information. You don't need it. But the next step is interesting, is the step where you are working on competencies. So competencies is just a mix of skills, ability, and knowledge, and you are taking, mobilizing uh, these three elements to effectively solve a task. So that's the important point. It's the solving task um, part. So one competency is one combination of skills, abilities, and knowledge needed to perform one specific task. And people, pupils, in the future world, in the current world also, always want to solve something. And that should be the starting point of the program, of the curriculum, of what we do in schools. What do you want to do? What do you want to solve? I will help you to solve it. I will give you some skills, abilities, knowledge. You will also find some. You will give it to me. And the teacher and the student, the learner, will co-create together the necessary competencies to solve this task. And I think that's the way we should go. And that's what I'm trying in my um, university. So what I made is that for each courses that I am uh, teaching, I give the students a list of competencies. So I tell them, OK, at the end of my course, you will be able to prove me that you can, uh, that you have acquired these competencies. How do you prove it to me? So first thing is that I provide some assessment to my students. I tell them, OK, if you manage to do this project, you will be working on these competencies. If you manage to solve these uh, multiple choice questions, you will try to acquire these uh, skills. The next interesting step is that I'm saying to my students, if you want to come to me with a personal project, with a project that you made in another course, and you agree with me that you will be working on several competencies, just come to me, present it to me, and I will check if you acquired them. If you acquire them, I will give you a star. So the idea is that my students now are fighting in some way to get stars, because the only way to succeed my courses is to have five stars for each of the competencies. And maybe the most radical way, um, the most radical thing I made is that for my courses, either they have zero as a grade, either they succeed the course. There is no in-between. There is no, I have nine, nine out of 20. I nearly succeeded, but not completely. No, you manage to have the competencies I want you to have or no, and that's it. And they like it. They like it a lot because they took back the control over their education because they know what I want them to achieve, but they are proposing themselves how they prove it to me. In some way, I just removed the fear to fail. When you have an exam, when you have a test, you fear to fail it. If I fail it, I have to wait the next session to try it again. Here, they can come at any time. They just come to me, we sit down like this. It's kind of evaluation face to face. And they prove to me that they acquired the competencies I want them to acquire in any way. And so, if the interview goes uh, wrong, it's not a failure. They just miss one opportunity to get a star and to improve their competencies. And we'll see next time. And during the interview, I can tell them directly, direct feedback. It's a learning habit that Veronica um, told us uh, last day. Direct feedback is important. And removing the fear to fail is also, in my opinion, very important. So I'm trying this. It's the first year or I'm doing this. For now, students are quite happy. Um, of course, I have to evaluate my, uh, my proposition, my tool, uh, and we'll see in a, a short future if, uh, if it works. Just my opinion uh, now is that they seem happy 
and uh, they come to me with assessment proposition. So that was what I wanted. They take back over the control on their own education on their own, um, at their own pace. A second thing that I'm doing, a second thing that I'm doing is I created some micro courses. So these micro courses are on very specific subject that maybe the industry is not interested in right now. Uh, for example, I have a micro course on quantum computing. Quantum computing, this new kind of computers, people are working on it. We don't know exactly if it will be useful today. But let me just, micro course is around seven hours of work for the student. It's about one hour of, uh, of um, presential um, time that the teacher gives to the student. And the idea is just to give them the possibility to choose. So I have a set of about 10 micro courses for now, and they just choose, they have to choose two out, out of them. And they choose it according to what they prefer, what they want. So for me, it's important to let the student choose what he uh, or she uh, wants, because he will create the future like, uh, thanks to this. He will create it thanks to what he is curious about, what he would like to do. So again, it's the first year I'm trying this. Uh, I'll see in a, in a few months if it works. For now, they are even more excited by these micro courses than the courses of my colleagues. So that's a little bit the issue that I have in my institution. Colleagues are saying, why all the students are choosing your courses and not attending ours? But as it was said yesterday, we have to to, to be a little bit crazy, uh, if we want to try to change uh, something, we have to uh, try to break down the system in some way. So, to conclude, for me, three important elements, the teacher, the learner, and the professionals. The academic world, industry world, and the, the learner. I put them in a circle because I don't like triangles, because in a triangle you always try to go in one of the corners. In a circle, you have to go round between all the elements. Because for me, a teacher is also a learner. He has to continue to learn every time. For me, a teacher is also a professional, educational professional. And it's the same in the old way. A student, for me, a learner, should also be a professional. Being a student is a work. A student should also be a teacher. We have to co-create together the content. It's the same for the professional. The professional has also to learn to be a student, to be um, up to date and has also to be a teacher because a professional has to give some trainings in his uh, company. So for me, the future of education should connect more these three elements than today. And at the center, I put the need of society because we don't have to just do something uh, for fun. We have to do something for fun that is useful for the society. So, Coming, yes. Future skills, so we don't know what they will be. We have to think about them. But for sure, the world is changing rapidly. And very important elements are the environmental, economic, and social challenges. So for me, the future skills we have to think about, in addition to some uh, creativity skills, leadership, communication skills, is how to equip the young people of today with skills that will help them find solutions to environmental, economic, and social challenges of the world. The end, the end of pure knowledge, I told you about this, you have a smartphone, you have access to information. You don't need to learn any more these. You need to understand what you are doing. Future school, more focused on the learner, more individualized, more personalized, and with a sense of responsibility to participate in the world. The tasks you want to solve are tasks that should help the world go uh, better. In some way, the end of vertical education, uh, by vertical education, I mean you go to primary school, secondary school, high school, specialized school, PhD, and you are already 25, 30 years old, and then you start to think about, ha, ah, what can I do now? What will I do? I'm just exhausted, I want to sleep two years, and then I will maybe think at what I will do. 
No, we have to be more personalized and we have to give the tools as fast as possible to the young people so that they can help us to, to solve uh, the, the challenges for the future world, for their worlds in some way. So, that's it for uh, my presentation. I hope I gave you some insights and things to think about and uh, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions for Mr. Combefis? We can take a few uh, in the back there. Thank you very much for this uh, good uh, presentation. I have two remarks. One is to disrupt the education of today. What you said is, in my view, not a disruption. It's a reformation, continuation. It's disruption means you make really a break. What you said is not a break, is a, is a, a good and nice and important further um, continuity. So I think we need to be a bit careful. The, the word disruption becomes so fashionable that it becomes meaningless very soon, I think. But my main uh, point is the future is to disrupt the education of today. I would uh, challenge the skills of the future, one of the skills I think we need in the future is to live in situations or to survive in situations where technologies are not available. We all know, and I made this test with students in India, in Bangalore a month ago and in, in uh, Moscow uh, how, six weeks ago. Imagine you have no mobile phone for the next six uh, uh, days. What do you do? Uh, imagine um, you have the satellite was hacked, which provides you with all the information you depend on, what do you do? So this kind of exercise means we need then to develop the skills without dependency on these um, technologies. Uh, it's not at, at all against the technologies, they are very important, but we depend so much now on it that it becomes a danger. That's, for me, the skills of the future that we have to learn. What is your answer on that? I completely agree with you about um, the fact that without technology, we will be lost. Maybe we will be able to, to tackle it, but young people today will be completely lost because they are not trained to live without it. They don't even be, they, they are not able to imagine what would be the world without access to internet and technology. I went to, to a meeting a few days ago and, and the topic was if I just put an electromagnetic, electromagnetic uh, bomb in the world, on the world, it's a bomb that will kill everything that is electronic. How do we react to this? So for me, it's part of the, the social challenges of the world. Access, access to education, access to um, to, to all the information, to the knowledge, to the skills that we need uh, to, to survive, just as you said. So it's not only relying on technology. What I said is that technology is here. So for now, we have to use it to help uh, the younger people to, to educate themselves with technology. But of course, in the social part, I don't have the time to, to, to explain everything here uh, in my, um, my opinions about everything. But you have to think about also what would happen, of course, if there is no uh, technology. About the environmental issue is the same. We have to equip the young people today with the skills so that they will be able to think about if we continue like that and if we have a, a complete climate disaster, what will be the, the solution to this? So it's also very important. And about the disruption, I completely agree that I just gave some insights to new um, way to learn. For me, we can go even further. For me, for example, as I said, people get educated to solve tasks, to solve issues of the world, of industry in particular. So maybe we have to take the need of industry, maybe we have to build our schools not in the vertical way, as I explained, but taking competency from the industry that they need putting them on the table and ask to each student, okay, what do you want to work on? And we, as educators, we are good at building material to learn things. 
So for example, we could take a set of competencies that a company asks, and we built a course just for these competencies, and then the students that is interested in this will come and work on these competencies with the teacher. Okay. Yes, Sebastien. Uh, I really liked your uh, keynote, it was really inspiring. Um, one thing though, I'm not completely agreeing with you, and that's about uh, the need for knowledge. Um, because, of course, you work with students, and they had their primary and secondary education already, and they're motivated to come to your classroom. Eh? So I can see that it really works in that situation. But that's because they had already some skills and knowledge uh, that you could use and that they could use to learn more. So what's your opinion on that? The need for basic knowledge, maybe? Of course. So if you remember the triangle that I showed, the first layer of co the second layer, sorry, is very important. So the first layer is the trait and characteristic. Everyone has its own, uh, her own trait characteristic. We can't do anything about this. Then, of course, you need the first layer. You need, at some point, some basic knowledge. It's important because you can't build any competencies if you don't have skills, knowledge. So it's important. We have to think about a system where you have this first layer that is built. Maybe we don't need that everyone has all the basic knowledge. That's also the point of the personalized learning. Do we need people to do six years of basic education before getting them to the next level and try to solve interesting tasks for the future? That was my point. So uh, I have a question here. Yes, yeah, Sebastian, I think uh, your uh, presentation was great. S here, Sebastian, your presentation was, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> So your presentation was great and uh, uh, you have introduced new ways of uh, teaching skills. So what is the uh, marked difference that you see in the outcomes of your uh, teaching? Uh, that is number one. Number two is like when you said competency, it, if you break up competency, there are four components to it. That is skills, education, knowledge and attitude. So if the attitudinal aspect is not taken care of, then competency is not completely built. So how to handle that part? So first for the um, results, so, so as I said, I just started this this year. So for now, it's just my observation that I have about this. And students are quite excited about this. So as I, say, as I said, they took back the control of their learning. They come to me and they say to me, okay, last year I worked on a project for my friend and it covers some of the competencies that you are asking me to prove. Can I just use this work? Come, present, explain it to you. So I think that the relation also between the teacher and the, uh, the students is more better than before. We are not uh, in an examiner position anymore. It's more like a discussion w with the students. So that's everything I can say to you just now. So if you're interested in future results, please co let's contact and I will can send you some uh, results in the future. Um, okay. One more question, please. Just a second part. It was the attitude. Evaluating it should require you to have some competencies about it. So for now, since I'm in the master level, I have my competencies more technical. So of course, we can in some way add some competencies in the system and require the students to uh, work on them. And since you have these private, I would say, one-to-one -one, um, interviews, it's maybe the point where you can evaluate this. For example, is the student able to correctly uh, lead an interview? That should be an attitude position that you can um, try to, to, to measure in this way. Some ethical issues, for example, you could have one competency, which is, is the student able to um, talk about some ethical issues and give some correct uh, arguments? One last question. Hi, it's me here. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. That's a really wonderful uh, insight and presentation. And actually, I had a reflection on a couple of uh, questions asked and what you were saying, um, and on the notion of uh, troubleshooting and um, sort of reacting to what life throws at us unexpectedly. And I, uh, I think, I'm not sure, but it is a little to do with the fact that um, it is hard to teach that skill in a classroom because uh, we learn to troubleshoot on the job, on life, during life, right? And 
often people who don't have access to higher education, to all the fancy courses, they're the best at, at agility, at flexibility, troubleshooting, because that's what they had to deal with. And I think it's a, um, one, I think the first question, or actually Bert said it as well, that it is, there's some things that are unnecessary for everyone to learn, um, because it is just, it takes their, too much of their time, if you know what I mean. And you said that as well, that there's certain things like um, math that you don't have to learn in that depth because the computer will do it for you. But to, to sort of dot connect the fact that this is the equation you need is something that has to be taught. So it's just sort of, it's not a question, it's just a reflection on what you were saying. So, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your reflection. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.